Glad to see you with us. Would you stand with us as we begin our worship?
there was no freedom. People is like having like a really hard life and they go into the jail and then government kill them. The entire Sudanese civil war I uh, started in my hometown. Everybody's corrupted. Everyone is corrupted. There's the rebels, there's all these people fighting. They call you silly. Government don't let to us to go to the church. They came on the land and you know they were just just just, just killing everybody. Well I talked to my neighbor about Jesus. What they beat the fire on us. So everybody had to jump into the water. Her mother started to believe to Jesus, and then her husband killed her. It was nightmare getting separated from your parents. That night we were just seeing bullets. Like I thought they were fireflies, but they were actually bullets. Her husband said, "If I find who talk about you to the Jesus, I'm gonna find them and I'm gonna kill them too." We escaped and got into the mountains, into the forest. We had actually run uh, quite fast in the My parents, they say, like, we can live here anymore. And we found ourselves in a refugee camp in Ethiopia. I lived in a refugee camp for seven years. And we went to the United Nations. I did always pray about getting to a better place. Now that I've come here, I've got the freedom to go to school, um, study what I want, be who I want. You can wear whatever you want, you can go to the church. Here, I have opportunities. I'm studying biotechnology, engineering, and uh, graphic designing. My master's uh, in accounting. After I finish college, I want to be a lawyer. God always take up the cheetah and the us. I've asked him everything I've ever wanted and everything I've got. I mean, I saw how God is good.
sinners to be seated with you, with your Son, our Messiah. And so with grateful hearts we receive your invitation to partake of this most holy meal. God, prepare us to be humbled by our sins, restored by your grace, and made ready for your final return. Stir up within us a desire to glorify you by faith in your Son, without whom there would be no supper, no fellowship. Lord, grant this for Jesus' sake. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It was on the occasion of Passover that Jesus called together his disciples to demonstrate what God was about to do.
it may seem a little bit strange for us, but the fact of the matter is, God knew that we needed some sort of dramatic appeal to our imaginations, to our hearts and minds, to realize and acknowledge or to recognize in a way the suffering and the sacrifice of Christ for our sins. And so he gave us this symbolic meal, which represents the wafer representing the body of Christ and the juice representing the blood. And these are COVID responsible cups. And so we uh, take off the time now. It's crazy, isn't it? Uh, Jesus is going to come when we're doing this. <laughs> and he's just going to say, I like it the other way. But anyway, if you would take the uh, tasteless thing out of uh, bread. And I, I don't mean to make a mockery at all. This represents the very body of our Savior. In other words, he gave of himself the most that he could give, and that was his physical self. He gave himself for our sin. He took our place on the cross so that we wouldn't have to suffer for our sins. If you would join with me for this. Lord Jesus, we keep thanking you. We really can't thank you enough for all that you've done. And one of the most important things you've done, Lord God, is you've uh, embraced death by uh, taking our death and our sins upon yourself on the cross and receiving the punishment that we deserve. And that in your taking away our sins, Lord, we can be liberated, set free, just like these people on the video were sharing, that we have such great liberty in our country. Plus, on top of that, we have the liberty of, of the gospel of Jesus in our hearts and our lives to keep us mindful of the fact that life is more than just making a living or, or just doing what other people do and trying to look as good as they do, but it's about having a relationship to the Creator. And we're grateful to you, Lord Jesus, for providing that, uh, that, that relationship. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. And then if you just peel off the top of that again, it exposes the juice. And what this juice represents is the blood of Christ. We know, and I don't know if you've ever been around uh, maybe a, an accident or, or a, you know, some kind of a terrible occurrence, but the smell of death, uh, and it mostly it's blood, is a horrible thing. It, it just is repugnant uh, to the human uh, mind. <laughs> it's just awful. Uh, and yet Jesus literally gave his blood as a sacrifice for our sins. Lord Jesus, once again, we're here to give you thanks because we don't know what else to say. It, it all seems like sort of a fairy tale or a, a just sort of a myth or a made-up story to a lot of people. But for us who've been chosen by you to become believers, dear God, it's the very life spring of everything that we are. Without you, Lord God, we're just like everybody else. We're just another person. But with you, we have the the force of the entire universe at our disposal because of your goodness and your kindness. We thank you, Lord, that you would just uh, accept our thanks and use us, dear God, this day to share this great news of liberty, not only for our country. We're grateful for our country, for our president, for uh, those who serve. I know we make fun, and I'm one of the worst to kind of gripe and complain about what these people do. But we ask your guiding hand upon them and ask your uh, conviction in their hearts to do the right thing for the people of this country and to extend liberty to people everywhere. That we too might extend uh, that liberty here in our country beyond even to the souls of people who have been enslaved by sin. That your gospel would reign in their hearts. In your blessed name we pray. Daniel chapter 9, verses 1 through 3 says, It was the first year of the reign of Darius the Mede, the son of Osiris, who became king of the Babylonians. During the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, learned from reading the word of the Lord, as revealed to Jeremiah the prophet, that Jerusalem must lie desolate for 70 years. So I turned to the Lord God and pleaded him with, 
with him in prayer and fasting. I also wore rough burlap and sprinkled myself with ashes. Day kind of sermon. I, I'm not going to uh, uh, really address that. I'm, I'm going to continue on with uh, the book of Daniel. But if you have your Bibles, I really want you to uh, turn to Daniel chapter 9. Uh, and, and we're going to look at these. I'll, I'll have it on the screen. But uh, it really, uh, I, I hope that you'll get something from it. We've been considering 
the prophet Jeremiah's original prophecy, uh, where you know all of this uh, drama kind of comes from, uh, that because of Israel's idolatry, because of her sinfulness, the whole country, he said, would become a desolate wasteland, and they would serve the king of Babylon 70 years. And, and the way you know that a prophet is a true pop prophet is that the prophecy comes true, and uh, Jeremiah was right on the spot. I mean, they were absolutely, they had lost their land, they had lost the temple, they would lost everything, just as God had warned them. Both the books of Kings and Chronicles, of which I'm not going to bore you with reading right now, recount the, the dreadful years after Israel's <clears throat> excuse me, dramatic decline and her downfall that led to this enslavement, this uh, captivity that she was in at the time that Daniel wrote his prophecy. Having studied Jeremiah's prophecy some 70 years uh, after the fact, the prophet Daniel now says in chapter 9, verse 2, in his book, that he understood the word of the Lord given to Jeremiah. In other words, it made sense to him, and, and Jeremiah had it right, that the desolation of Jerusalem would last 70 years. So he, that is, Daniel prayerfully petitions God to fulfill his promise to deliver now the Israelites from exile and return them to their homeland so that they could rebuild their temple. When the 70 years are completed, the Lord had promised Jeremiah I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to Israel. Well, that's the way it's going to work. I'll promise this, and then I'll fulfill it. And so in Daniel chapter 9, verse 20, the prophet Daniel receives the details of how God's going to fulfill his plan using the angel Gabriel as his spokesperson. So let's look at chapter 9, beginning with verse 20. While I was speaking and praying, this is Daniel talking, confessing my sin and the sin of of my people and making my request to the Lord my God for his holy hill, verse 21, while I was still in prayer. Gabriel, the man I had seen in the earlier vision, he refers to Gabriel as a man only because he had the figure of a man. This still is nonetheless an angel. I had seen in the earlier vision that his Gabriel came to me in swift flight about the time of the evening sacrifice. Verse 22, he instructed me and said to me, Daniel, I have now come to give you insight and understanding, which is my hope that we will gain. As soon as you begin, verse 23, as soon as you begin to pray, began to pray rather, a word went out which I have come to tell you, for you are highly esteemed, therefore consider the word and understand the vision. In other words, I can tell even by the posture of your prayer, the fact that you responded to me in prayer that this is something that, I, that, that you need to have fulfilled. Like Jeremiah's prophecy at the beginning of the 70 years, Gabriel's message to Daniel was important to God's people and their future. Now at this point, they weren't sure really what would become of the nation since it was the Babylonians that had taken over or had taken them in, into enslavement, but it's the Medo-Persians who have taken over the Babylonians in 539 B.C. So they've changed management, so to speak. So Daniel carefully studies Jeremiah's prophecy to see what God's people might expect in the time to come. And I'm sure he gathered them up in a group like this and he said, you guys, listen, this is, this is what I got. Let's pick up in verse 24. Seventy sevens. And you know right away we're in trouble because what is that about? Seventy-sevens are decreed for your people, your holy city, to finish transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for wickedness, to bring it in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. Know and understand, verse 25, from, the, from this time forward, from the time forward goes out, excuse me, from the time the word goes out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, until the anointed one, the ruler, comes, there will be seven sevens and sixty-two sevens. It will be rebuilt with streets and a trench, but in times of trouble. After the sixty-two sevens of trouble, after, excuse me, after the sixty-two sevens, the anointed one will be put to death and will have nothing. The people of the ruler who will come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end will come like a flood. The war will continue until the end, and desolations have been decreed. He will confirm a covenant with many for one's 
for one seven. In the middle of the seven, he will put an end to the sacrifice and offering. And at, and at the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. Everybody's got that, right? <laughs> As Daniel explained to Jeremiah, uh, or uh, as, uh, or excuse me, as Daniel examined Jeremiah, he would have to read chapter 30, he had to have read chapter 31, verse 31, where God had promised that the days are coming when I will make a new covenant. You see, the things with Israel just hadn't worked out. These people were just, they just, ugh. It will not be a covenant like I made with your ancestors, that is the Israelite ancestors, because they broke my covenant, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No more tablets of stone. It's going to be right in here, in your heart. You see, not only had God promised Israel that they would return to their homeland and rebuild the temple, of which they would, but that his covenant would be renewed and that the Messiah would come and establish his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Gabriel's prophetic proclamations in Daniel chapter 9 would provide the insight and understanding for those who, like the prophet, were wise enough to listen and learn. And it's not easy, I grant you. It had been a long 70 years. They had lived as slaves in a foreign land under foreign rule. So Daniel, who had already suffered being put into a lion's den for praying once before, prays again fearlessly to God for insight and understanding. You see, Daniel feared God more than he feared the king. While I was speaking and praying, says Daniel in verse 20, confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel, Gabriel said to me, Daniel, I have now come to give you insight and understanding. For Daniel, those living within the time frame of Jeremiah's 70 year prophecy, God's judgment had been harsh because of Israel's harsh sinfulness. And savage civil sinfulness. But hopefully, all of this was going to be over. What's more, even though the conclusion of the prophecy was near, there were still going to be some painful reminders of just how sinful Israel had been. As we've read, the Lord promptly responds to Daniel's prayer by sending Gabriel, who explains God's prophetic plan, including the events in Israel's expected future, or what's referred to as the 70 weeks. That's where things get a little bit complicated. Even in our English translations, it's easy to see that the number seven is being used here symbolically to represent God's complete and perfect plan. We've got to be careful about getting all caught up in this world, seven times seven, all this kind of stuff. This is not a math quiz. This is intended to give you, it's, it's like the book of Revelation, it's intended to give you and me the courage to face the trials and tribulations that are a part of this world that we live in. God's plan for Israel was to fulfill Jeremiah's prophecy by answering Daniel's prayer and delivering his people back to their homeland. But there was so much more on God's mind than just the rescue of Israel from foreign captivity, as we'll see. God's plan would require the people's persistent faithfulness and trust in his plan, despite the occasional bumps and bruises that were sure to come. In his 1985 book, Beyond Hunger, Art Beals tells a story about the late senator from Oregon, Mark Hatfield, who was touring Calcutta in, in India with uh, Mother Teresa in the late 70s. They were visiting the infamous House of Dying. If you know anything about the Sisters of Charity, you know that they operate this house where unwanted children uh, are left by their parents who can no longer care for them in the last days of their life. lives. It's just it's horrible. Anyway, there were suffering patients lying everywhere as he and Mother uh, Mark Hatfield and, and Mother Teresa were looking on them, lying everywhere in make on makeshift cots uh, with people lined up by the hundreds uh, outside waiting for their turn to receive the sisters' care. Watching Mother Teresa and her team tirelessly minister to these poor dying children, uh, feeding and nursing them unto their death, Hatfield was overwhelmed by the sheer magnitude of the suffering and heartache he was seeing, and I, I can't even imagine. How can you bear the load, he asked Mother Teresa, without being crushed by it? And she quietly replied, my dear Senator, I'm called to be, I'm not called to be successful, I'm called to be faithful. 
Daniel and the Israelites could now prepare to return home in accordance with God's prophetic promise, but they had to be faithful. In verse 24, Gabriel tells Daniel that 77s are decreed to finish transgression and put an end to sin. And then he lists what they're, expect, what, what they're to expect as fulfillment of God's decree as it unfolds. Number one, to atone for wickedness. In other words, to forgive sin. To bring everlasting righteousness, sanctification, holiness. Number three, to seal off the vision and prophecy. Some of this would be fulfilled before their eyes. Some of it will come later. Fourth, to anoint the most holy place. The 70 weeks of Daniel are generally understood to mean that there were 70 weeks of years, or 70 times 7 years, equaling 490 years. The meaning of timelines in terms of weeks of, of 7 years and so on was common in Daniel's day among Gentiles as well as Jews. It was like an algorithm is to us today. It was just a way that you did things. However, Babylonians, Persians, and Hebrews, all these different kinds of cultures had different kinds of calendars. Some were lunar calendars according to the moon, some were solar calendars according to the sun. Some of them were just ludicrous, didn't do them according to anything. Israel's exile in Babylon had lasted 70 Hebrew years, or, or a week of years according to the Hebrew calendar. And so their restoration and the coming of the Messiah would be seven times longer than that, or 70 weeks of years, which is a total of 490 years, pretty good long time, half a millennium. Many of them had understood the 70 weeks to, or they've come to believe that the 70 weeks to be a literal period of 490 Gregorian calendar years as we count them in our day. However, they didn't use a Gregorian calendar. In Daniel's day, and the Julian calendars that's been imposed upon a lot of scripture was just one among many that the people in various cultures used in their day. So while the, pro the, the prophecy does work out closely in terms of, you know, years and all that stuff, it's important, its importance really is less about precision time-wise and more about the historical significance of God's intervention. It's like the book of Revelation. Don't get caught up in the details of something that's meant to tell you something very obvious. Like the 70 years of Jeremiah's prophecy, which actually works out to something like 66 years, according to our calendar anyway. Trying to pin down the precise historical proof of exactly 70 solar years is just impossible. So all these modern day wizards of end times prophecy who use uh, this and other passages to substantiate their popular claims uh, are misleading, I think, to say the least. But it's worth noting that the numbers 7 and 70 are used symbolically throughout Scripture to represent God's complete perfection, the sum of which was part of his plan for Israel. Like in Matthew chapter 8, verse 18, verse 22, where Jesus responds to Peter's question, how many times should I forgive a brother or a sister who sins against me? And the Savior says, 70 times 7. Now, of course, Jesus wasn't suggesting that Peter forgive an offender exactly 490 times, and then on the 491st, you know, slap the snot out of him. That misses the whole point. It makes sense to understand the 7 times 70 in Daniel as being symbolic, as are most biblical numbers, rather than literal. So kind of avoid that stuff if you can. It makes sense to understand the 7 times 70 as symbolic. From Daniel's perspective, the time frame was arranged to show how the Messiah would do away with Israel's transgression or sin and achieve her restoration, not decode the exact day of the Messiah's arrival. Despite the difficulty of this passage, and I understand that it can be difficult, Gabriel really wasn't trying to confuse or discourage Daniel, even though its fulfillment would come a long time after he was dead. I mean, let's face it, Daniel was 80 years old at the time, and, by the, and he was staring old age in the face. I don't think he expected to witness the rebuilding of Jerusalem or the temple before he died. Despite the human desire for immediate gratification, that just isn't how God works. I'm not sure what all the virtues we lost when Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, but I'm pretty sure that patience was one of them, because I don't have any. 
Most of us could barely remember the days when we had to wait for television and radio tubes to warm up before we could watch our favorite black and white cartoons. That's old, isn't it? <laughs> you guys don't even know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Yet Daniel 9 reveals that God's time frame for the salvation of his people and the restoration of their land wasn't going to happen overnight, but it was going to happen. Now Daniel's vision revealed the, com the completion of Israel's promised restoration that it would come in stages. The first stage, meaning the first set of sevens or weeks, would include the time from God's answering Daniel's prayer for Israel's restoration to the time when that restoration actually occurred along with the rebuilding of Jerusalem and the temple. Now, it's not likely that the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem mentioned in verse 25 was necessarily referring to the particular decree of King Cyrus or Xerxes or some of these other kinds of kings, as is often assumed. Rather, it was God's response to Daniel's prayer in verse 23 that marked the beginning of the fulfillment. The distinction between earthly and heavenly decrees is vital to gaining insight and understanding with regards to Daniel's prophecy in chapter 9. The first seven of Daniel's 70 weeks shows God's response to Daniel's prayer that Jerusalem would be rebuilt. Jeremiah's 70 years prophecy would, would find partial fulfillment when this was accomplished, sure enough, in 515 BC upon the completion of the second temple under the leadership of Ezra and Nehemiah. You see, there was a, a temple that Solomon built. It was destroyed by the Babylonians. And then there was a second one that was built. It's the one that they built it. And then after they were done, they looked at it and said, gosh, it sure isn't Solomon's temple. Anyway, the period of restoration, along with the uh, subsequent 62, 62 sevens after the city was rebuilt, would also be a time of trouble for God's people, just as Gabriel had warned. Israel wouldn't enjoy complete safety and freedom as described in Jeremiah 33:16, with regards to the new covenant just quite yet. The Messiah still hadn't made his appearance, and he wouldn't do so until the end of the 69 sevens, ushering in the, clim the climactic 70th week. And that week would be, of course, split in half. Even then, the Messiah would be put to death or cut off, says some of your translations, leaving him with nothing. It's human nature to assume that if God is in control of history, then things should run as, as smooth as a 51-minute episode of Star Trek with no commercials. Sure, we'll accept a few historical hiccups here and there, but on the whole, we expect God to make the path of his promised fulfillment uh, regarding prophecies relatively smooth and straight. And yet notice that 69 out of Daniel's 70 weeks of sevens are marked by difficulties and trials, according to this text, and that the 70th week was going to be no picnic either. The prophetic future that Daniel was shown by Gabriel is one that would encompass wars and rumors of wars, as Jesus would explain later in Matthew chapter 24, along with trials and tribulations that would test the people's faithfulness for years to come. And yet the fact of the matter is, these trials would actually provide the believer's pathway to glory because they'll be in the footsteps of Christ himself, the Messiah, who journeyed from life to death to eternal life by way of the cross. God doesn't demand anything from us. He's not willing to endure himself. His very own anointed one came into this world and suffered firsthand what it's like to be put to death and left with nothing. Listen to Isaiah's prophetic description of Jesus, the Messiah, in chapter 53 from the message translation. This is 600 years before Jesus was ever born. Who would have thought that God's saving power would look like this? The servant grew up before God, a scrawny seedling, a scrubby plant, and a parched field. He was looked down upon and passed over a man who suffered, who knew pain firsthand. We looked down on him as though he was scum. We thought he brought it on himself that God was punishing him for his own failures. But it was our sins that did that to him, that, that ripped and tore and crushed him. Our sins, he took the punishment, and that made us whole. Through his bruises, we get healed, and God has piled our sins, everything we've done wrong, on him. 
Daniel's prayer in verses 4 through 19 is based on his reading of Jeremiah's prophecy, and sure enough, God would provide an answer to his prayer, sending Gabriel to divulge this prophetic plan. Forgiveness, reconciliation, and justice were the things Daniel and the Israelites had been longing for during all those 70 years of captivity. And now with this prophecy in hand, they could renew their hopes that the future still held out promise because of God. Jerusalem's temple, desecrated and nearly destroyed by Antiochus Epiphanes IV in 164 BC, witnessed the uh, so-called or the uh, called abomination that causes desolation when this evil dictator, calling himself God, outlawed Israel's temple sacrifices and replaced them with sacrifices to the sky god Zeus. And thus Israel's trials and tribulations were far from over. They would actually continue to get worse over the course of the 490 years. When Jesus was born about 450 years after Daniel's prayer, he would indeed be put to death, as predicted, and when, he was, when he was crucified on a, on a Roman cross. But the most difficult part of Daniel's vision is what follows Jesus' death as the Messiah. It's at this point that Gabriel's passage, or Gabriel's message, he tells the prophet that Jerusalem and its sanctuary would be destroyed by the people of the ruler who will come. Now many have convinced themselves, and I understand that this is, uh, because this is a very difficult Hebrew, and I don't read Hebrew very well, but it's very difficult to translate. But in the middle of verse 26, that many people believe that somehow it marks a point at which a sudden change is made in reference from describing Jesus as the anointed one, the Messiah, in the first part of the verse, to some futuristic antichrist they identify to be uh, the ruler in the second part of the verse. Others have denied any Christian connection at all to Daniel's prophecy, uh, that rather it's a reference to some, to Israel, to other kinds of things. And again, I understand their positions, but my sincere response to these uh, really extra biblical speculations just really don't fit the passage. This ruler in verse 26 is Christ himself, who set out to fulfill God's new covenant as spelled out by Jeremiah in chapter 3 with his sacrifice for our sins. It was Christ who put an end to animal sacrifices by becoming a sacrifice unto God himself. As for the abomination that causes desolation mentioned in verse 27 that would take place in, uh, in, in response to, to Jesus, that would be God's response to Jesus' crucifixion. That's pre predicted in Matthew chapter 24 when later in 70 AD the temple and Jerusalem was just flattened, was absolutely destroyed. Gabriel's announcement to Daniel about the, the 70 weeks should be seen in the context of Jeremiah's prophecy of the new covenant as it's fulfilled when God sent his Holy Spirit to put his law in our minds and write it in our hearts so that we will be his people and he will be our God. With the coming of Christ, all things that Daniel predicted were, come, were accomplished our sins were forgiven or atoned for, our transgressions were removed, and the words of the prophets were vindicated. He was right. Of course, you could say that we're still waiting, awaiting the end of the 70th or the last half of the 70th week, as some do, and that will come with the final return of Christ. I understand all that. But when Jesus breathed his last breath, the curtain separating the holy place from the holy of holies was torn from top to bottom thus symbolizing not only our direct access to God as individual believers, but the final departure of God from his temple and from Israel after the nation had broken the covenant for the last time, the old covenant, by killing his only begotten son. The only person who could unite the two offices of the anointed one and the ruler found in Daniel 9.26 is Jesus Christ. Thus Daniel was being told by Gabriel that the sins of God's people, not the, not the Romans, not the Babylonians, but all those who receive his grace would destroy the temple in Jesus' day, just as the sins of God's people had destroyed the temple in Daniel's day. We have no one to blame but ourselves. Again, let me emphasize that the destruction of the city and the temple of Jerusalem in Daniel's day, as well as in Jesus' day, <clears throat> wasn't the work of Antiochus 
or any other Caesar that came as the result of Israel's sins. The general sense of Daniel 9 is that prophecy's timing is both symbolic and yet it's real. I don't want to over-symbolize things. A literal 490 years from King Cyrus' edict in 538 B.C., uh, or the restoration of the temple in 515 B.C., which are at the core of what most people argue about in Daniel these days, really are not necessary. These dates and their historical significance are a means of preparing God's people for what's to come as it occurs rather than codes for outguessing when the world is going to come to an end. Even if you and I are guilty of having crucified Christ for our sins, and we are, or we've taken his name in vain, or, or we've lied or cheated against him, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, God's grace is still sufficient for your forgiveness and mine. Romans chapter 5 verse 8 says, but God demonstrates his love for us and that while we're still sinners, Christ died for us. Even if we've rebelled and transgressed against him in every possible way, there's still hope. While sacrifices and offerings under the law of the Old Covenant were once the means for sinful men and women to approach God in the Old Testament, now that Christ has come and died for our sins, His sacrifice is enough to forgive the most hideous from among us. Known for his landmark commentary on Paul's letter to the Romans and being really the most influential theologian since Martin Luther, a group of reporters awaited the famous Karl Barth, who was a Swiss theologian, to arrive so that they could interview him. Eventually, you know, everybody was writing books about the second coming of Christ, that the world was going to come to an end, and they wanted to find out from him. Now, this was in the late 50s, and America was at war with the Koreans at the time, is still recovering from World War II. Anyway, as Barth came toward the reporters that had gathered there, camera bulbs flashed, and the usual questions were offered regarding what he thought about. Uh, this issue and that. And he tried to answer as many questions as he could, but eventually he excused himself from the crowd in order to, uh, to head towards his appointments. Just as he stepped away, one of the reporters yelled out after him, hey Carl, you're the greatest theologian since Luther, and I guess the guy was sort of kidding. Tell us the most important lesson you've learned from all your studies. And Bart turned around toward the questioner and he said with his head kind of low, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. It really does make about that much sense. It's just so simple. Daniel 9 shows us that with genuine prayer and meditation upon the truths revealed in, in Scripture, in God's Word, that ordinary men and women can be prepared for the future. There will be Christ-like moments when God's providence will lead us to the very edge of our faith, and about all we'll be able to say is, well, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. But whenever that happens, we'll be prepared. Not because we're lucky or smart, or because we've figured out the secret code that tells us exactly when the world will end. But because God's prophetic plan has given us insight and understanding for the future, and we can always count on Him. If you would stand with me for prayer. Lord, we've made our way through some pretty hairy stuff. <clears throat> and I know I haven't uh, done near as good a job as many before me, and hopefully some after. Nonetheless, Lord, we get the gist of what you're telling us, and that is, is that the future is in your hands. That when you tell us that you'll return, and in fact, you will return, it's not just a, just a story or a hope or a wish, it's the truth, and we're grateful for that truth. We pray, dear God, that we would prepare ourselves by being equipped as your church to do the things that you left us on this planet to do, and that is to, to go and make disciples, to, 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 to love our neighbor as ourselves, to, to love you with all our heart, soul, and mind. We pray, dear God, that you would open up our hearts to receive the blessing of your word this day, for Christ's sake and in his name. It's our custom to provide you with an opportunity to respond to this day's worship. If God is speaking to your heart. It's our tradition that you would uh, engage yourself in obedience to him 
as soon as possible, and that may be to, to come forward. If, if that's the case, I'll be glad to meet you here at the front. There may be other decisions that need to be made. As God is speaking to your heart, I'll be here at the front as Janet plays. I ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes.